Park. Okay. Well, let's go back to the beginning. I have a picture now. Oh, I see what to do with that, I think. Yes, good. Okay, so this is the beginning of it. Let me, um, let me start off. On the left here, in the lower left, you have a picture of Helen Phil Yoon. Um, it's a wonderful picture of Helen. She is, uh, I'll come back to this by the time we're done, but she's, uh, she lived all, all her adult life in Queens, New York. It's a borough of the city. And she lived there as fundamentally a professor. She was a professor at Queens College there, and she spent her whole life trying to write a Ruskin biography of great moment and uh, she never did. And part of that, that's why she's the unsung hero of Ruskin biography. On the right hand side is one of my favorite pictures of, of Ruskin in his, um, uh, uh, in the 19, 1860s and so on. So I'm gonna try to advance this and I can probably do it that way. Here's a lovely picture of Helen. Um, this is about when she's probably getting on close to 25 to 30 years old before she makes her Ruskin discoveries. I just want to give you a little bit of background about this wonderful picture of Ruskin that I love very much. This is the one that was done by John Everett Miele in the 1854-1855 period when Ruskin's uh, essentially marriage was falling apart and Miele was falling in love with Ruskin's wife, but that's another story, not for tonight, but it's a terrific portrait of uh, Ruskin at Ben Finless in, in Scotland. Um, so by way of background, I don't know that everyone here has a, sort of the same background in, in Ruskin. So I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about him because we have forgotten a lot about him as time has gone on. Here he is in his 20s, um, 1843. He is, um, he is 24 years old. He has just published a book called The Modern Painters, Their Superiority in the Art of Landscape Painting and uh, to, to all the ancient masters proved by, by examples of the true, the beautiful and the intellectual from the works of modern artists, specifically from those of J. W. M. Turner. Ruskin, when he was 13 years old, Ruskin was given a book by um, a friend of the family, uh, Turner's, uh, sorry, of Rogers' uh, Book of Poems on Italy. And in the middle of the book in various places, there were a number of images that had been created by Turner. And as soon as Ruskin saw them, he's only 13 years old. As soon as Ruskin saw them, he was just mesmerized by Turner's drawings of Venice and the Alps and various places in Switzerland and, and so on. He became so enthralled by this, he talked his parents into taking them, all three of them, his mother, his father, and himself to Switzerland and into the Alps and, he, and it changed his entire life. And he wanted to go to the places where Turner had painted things like, like this. This is Turner's wonderful painting um, it's at the Morgan Library in New York called the Pass of Fido. If you go through the Alps, you go over the St. Gotthard Pass and you come down into Bellinzona and then down into Italy that way, then this is something like what you see. But he fell in love with Turner because Turner saw so much of the beauty of nature, the excitement, the wonder of nature that he wanted, um, he wanted to go where Turner had gone. And when he came back, as he got a little bit older, 17, 18, 19, Turner was already very famous in the press and he was being vilified in the press as Ruskin got older. Ruskin became furious at um, this idea that this wonderful painter was being criticized in the press. This is one of the greatest Turner paintings ever done. It's at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, it's the slaver, it's from 1840. And Ruskin has a passage in Modern Painters, the first volume of Modern Painters, where he tries to show us that this is not just Turner's most wonderful seascape, it is the greatest seascape that has ever been painted by anybody. And he walks you through it. Space, corner by corner, the middle, the, corner, the left and the right. And if you look in the lower right hand, if you can see clearly enough in the image, in the lower right hand corner of the, um, of the painting in the dark area, you can see faces of sea monsters coming out of the ocean to devour the slaves that are being thrown overboard by the slave ship as it is in danger of foundering. The descriptions in Modern Painters 1, which Ruskin wrote in order to counter the, um, the attacks on Turner, are just mesmerizing. 
and people loved modern painters one so much this young guy became um, essentially uh, one of the most toasted people in all of Ling. And here, I'm going to go back to this earlier one, because I want to point out one thing. If you look in the middle of your screen, it says, by a graduate of Oxford. It doesn't say by John Ruskin. And I will explain that a little later. His name was not on it to begin, but it came it, later on in later volume. It, and sorry, later editions it would, but in the beginning he was just called a graduate of Oxford. And if we go back to the painting that accompanied it, he is there as called the author of Modern Painters, 1843. Ruskin saw, believed in the, the glory of nature. He said, everything wonderful in art has its origin in nature. And he said, if you really want to see nature, the only way that you can possibly see it is to go out and look at it yourself and if you can paint it yourself. So he became in the process of doing his art criticism, he became a very, very fine artist. This is his wonderful painting just to the south uh, of um, uh, Positano in, on the Amalfi Coast. It's just a stunner. It's at the, it's the Fog Museum in, in Boston and we were recently there for a, a conference last year on Ruskin's uh, it was the Ruskin two, two, uh, 200, two, his 200th birthday. And I got to see this in its original, and it's just breathtaking. But he was good not only at mountains and, and clouds and so on, he was good at wonderful little things. This is called um, Primroses in the Alps, another wonderful painting. And so Ruskin's hand was, was, was looking at nature, picking up all of these terrific things and then he wrote about how important art was in the world how important it was for us his primary purpose is to champion turner that's the first thing but the second thing is to sensitize his readers when the industrial revolution is winding up into its highest gear and pollution is everywhere not surprisingly in, in, in LA and California these days because of the fires. But he's trying to get people to say, this is your heritage. This is the place that you've been given to live. This is where you have to go to see what is great in the world, what is wonderful to see, what has been given to you as human beings, and you have to learn to reverence it. So here's a wonderful quote. I don't have enough time tonight to give you a, a sense of it, but this is um, of, of all of Ruskin's wonderful um, remarks about these things. Um, but here is a bit from Modern Painters, the epilogue to Modern Painters. He says, so far from art's being immoral, in the ultimate power of it, nothing but art is moral. Life without industry is sin, and industry without art, brutality. And this I say without reservation, that the knowledge of what is beautiful leads on and is the first step to the knowledge of the things which are lovely and of good report. And that the laws, the life, and the joy of beauty in the material world of God are as eternal and sacred parts of his creation as in the world of spirits, virtue, and in the world of angels, praise. It was writing like this that was so mesmerizing to the people who read Ruskin's early books. Here's one who read, read it. This is Charlotte Bronte. She, of course, is the famous author of Jane Eyre, and she read Modern Painters, and here's just a little bit of what she said about reading Ruskin's book. She wrote to a friend in a letter in, in July of 1848. She said, I have lately been reading Modern Painters, and I have derived from the work much genuine pleasure. Hitherto I have only had instinct to guide me in the judging of art and the viewing of nature. I now feel as if I have been walking blindfolded. This book seems to give me eyes." So Modern Painters was the beginning for Ruskin. He later on had a wonderful uh, three volume set where he told the story of Venice um, he told the story of Venice. The title of the book was The Stones of Venice. He said the entire history of Venice was in, in its monuments, in its stones itself. And he tried to, he wrote the book essentially as a warning to England because he believed that England was going down the path to degradation that Venice had trod before. Venice, when it was first, when it first rose, was a wonderful, moral, 
um, city and then slowly degenerated into the Renaissance. And as it did, it became a corrupt version of itself, um, uh, a corrupt version that hadn't been there before. And he was trying to get his English friends. This is the cover of a first edition of the, um, the uh, Stones of Venice, beautiful color. And um, this fellow on the left, his name is William Harcourt. He is the former Home Secretary and Chancellor of the Exchequer. And he wrote a letter to a friend in 1853, right after the Stones of Venice had come out. And he said this, have you read the second volume of Ruskin's The Stones of Venice? If you have not, beg, borrow, or steal it. It is one of the finest things that was ever written, full of inspiring eloquence and genuine genius. It recreates Venice, and one felt in reading it not only as if one was there again, but saw much more than is revealed to ordinary eyes. You will be in ecstasies at the gorgeous descriptions of St. Mark's Basilica. And on the right, a now number of decades later, a half century later, we have Virginia Woolf. And here is her assessment of modern painters. She said, modern page, she said, after 60 years from its publication, the style in which page after page of modern painters is written takes our breath away. And we find ourselves marveling at the world, words, as if all the fountains of the English language have been set playing in the sunlight for our pleasure. Now that is quite a tribute from a great writer to a great writer. I have to read, the, I have to read the last little bit again. It is as if all the fountains of the English language have been set playing in the sunlight for our pleasure. So any of us who write, I am one, Gabriel's one, numbers of others of you are out there are others. That would be a nice thing for somebody to write about what we wrote, yes? At least I certainly think so. So Ruskin's eloquence was one of the factors, but it was the truths that he wrote. And in the 1860s, I'll come back to this in a moment, but in the 1860s, he began, he began writing a number of social critiques. He was the first to really take on uh, laissez-faire capitalism or the corruption that he saw in laissez-faire capitalism um, uh, in English. Marx was out there writing in, in, in German and nobody knew anything much about Marx at all. So Ruskin really went and was the first to write a scathing critique of the inequities and the selfishness and the greed of capitalism. And he comes to the end of a four, four essay little book that he, he wrote in 1860. It's called uh, Unto This Last. And, it, and he, often, he often said that it was the single book that he ever wrote that was really truly worth something. It was the best book that he had ever written. And he ends it with, of course, the first, many of you know, are the first um, six words, uh, the most famous six words are quoted all the time about Ruskin. He said, there is no wealth but life. Life, including all its powers of love, of joy, and of admiration. That country is the richest which nourishes the greatest number of noble and happy human beings. That man is the richest who, having perfected the function of his own life to the utmost, has also the widest helpful influence, both personal and by means of his possessions over the lives of others. It's a wonderful bit. It's deeply against this notion that we are out for ourselves first and only. We are out for each other completely, Ruskin said, and he lived a life that essentially manifested this in his, uh, over the course of his life. For saying such things, for having the temerity to criticize the powers that be, he was vilified. That's another story. We'll get back to it another way. But one person who read unto this last in the latter part of the century was Mohandas Gandhi. And here is his assessment of reading unto this last for the first time. The book was impossible to set aside once I had begun. It gripped me. I could not get any sleep that night. It brought about an instantaneous and practical transformation. For in it, I found some of my deepest convictions reflected. Among them, Ruskin's idea that the good of the individual is contained in the good of all. And in the morning, I determined to change my life. 
in accordance with the ideals of the book. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. So here is the first page of Gandhi's translation of Onto This Last. He thought it was so important. He had it tra translated into Gujarati and circulated in India. So Ruskin's influence was so deep and profound to these other great thinkers. One more, I'm just trying to give you a sense of how he was thought of in his time, is Tolstoy. Of course, as we know, the great author of War and Peace and Anna Karenina. And he wrote of Ruskin, Ruskin is one of the most remarkable of men, not only in England at our time, but also of all countries and all times. He is one of those men who thinks with their heart. And so he thinks and says what he himself has seen and felt and what everyone will think and feel in the future. Ruskin was as famous as Dickens, as Gladstone, as Thomas Hardy, as Whit, as, uh, as Wordsworth, as any of the great writers, as the Bronte sisters, as famous as any of them. Whenever he spoke, um, he would often have to give lectures twice because so many people wanted to hear him. He was, in fact, one of the most important people of the century, and we have forgotten, unfortunately, to our detriment, certainly in my view, a lot about him. So that's a little background to give you a sense of how important Ruskin was. But now I want to get to the particular story that um, I want to tell you a little bit about tonight. I was really interested in Ruskin and Plato because I'm a sociologist. I had read a lot of Plato in my, um, in my essentially formative years as a sociologist. I loved, um, I loved reading Plato. And I started reading Ruskin's books back in, oh, it was like uh, 1989 in a serious way. And I began to say to myself, boy, this sounds like Plato. And so I got, try, looked for references of Ruskin and Plato, found almost nothing. And so then what I did is that I started thinking about, I, I went to the back of various books and looked for connections and bibliographic references and indices and really could find nothing. And then I hit on a great idea. I thought to myself, I'll go ask Professor Van Aken Bird, who, is one, who was then the reigning great biographer of Ruskin um, uh, in, in the middle of the, and to the very end of the 20th century. And he lived only, he lived only an hour and a half from me in Cortland, New York. And I thought, I'll call up Van Bird and I'll see whether, um, I'll see whether he knows anything about Ruskin and Plato. So I called him up. He's a very dear man. You get a sense of the dearness of him by just looking at the picture. I called him up and he said, oh yes, come along, we'll have a chat. And in the meantime, I'll look up uh, what I can find out about Ruskin and Plato. So a couple of weeks later, I arrived at Van's home. I go in and we have a nice greeting. We have a cup of tea. And he said, you know, Jim, I haven't found anything. I don't know anything about Ruskin and Plato, but he said, if anybody will know about Ruskin and Plato, it's Helen Phil Yoon. And now I knew about Helen Phil Yoon because she had by then, she had been dead for some time, but she had written a couple of, of books about Ruskin. One was called Ruskin's Scottish Heritage. We'll come back to that in a moment. And a later one was called The Brantwood Diary of John Ruskin. Um, both of these classics in the field. And he said, well, Helen and I were very good friends. And she had been working on an enormous biography of Ruskin. And she'd been working on it for 40 years, 45 years. And she never published it. And she thought that I would publish it. So she left it all to me when she died in 1974. And he said, so I looked at it and it was massive. It was immense. It was boxes upon boxes upon boxes of notes and drafts of chapters, et cetera, et cetera. And I was then just approaching 72. And I thought, I can never finish this. So what did I do? He said, I gave it to the Morgan Library because she studied there all her time. She loved the Morgan Library. It was a treasure trove to her. It gave her so many of the unpublished sources on Ruskin's life that she needed to write her biography. Why don't you and I, Jim, go to the Morgan Library and we'll dig out her stuff and you can have a look at it. So this is the reading room of the Morgan. 
Uh, actually, it's a new reading room. The old one was much prettier than this, but this isn't too bad. And we went and they brought up, at, at Van's instruction, they brought up all of these things that Helen had left unpublished. There were 34 chapters, draft chapters of her biography. There were 15 boxes about, uh, oh, probably about two feet by three feet, full of notes. Um, of eight and a half by eleven paper on every theme, every act, every book, every every year in Ruskin's life. There were a dozen shoe boxes full of little three by five pa um, papers, each of them holding about a thousand notes, all of which she was going to use in her final biography. And there she is again, about the time that she began to have her own transformation into becoming a Ruskin scholar. So I started going through the things of Helen's at the Morgan Library and I came across uh, a folder that she wrote very near the end of her life uh, in the last couple of months in her life. And it was called My Outline of Chapters. And she outlined what she was going to do in her biography had she ever had the chance to publish it. But she didn't. And I'll explain that a little bit later. But I said to Van on the way home in the car, Van, this is not like any of the biographies of Ruskin I've ever read. It's radically different. And he said, yes, it's radically different. Does anybody know about this? Van said, no, Helen knew about it. And I knew about it because I was her friend. And now you know about it. And so I began pulling together and giving a series of lectures on Helen's um, radically different view of Ruskin. Helen went to Brantwood in 1929. Brantwood was then a wreck. It was Ruskin's home. It had been Ruskin's home for the last 30 years of his life. He died in 1900, and it essentially had slowly drifted as the people who were living there drifted away themselves in their own lives. It had drifted into rack and ruin. Inside of Brantwood, here's a nice picture of it. This is Ruskin's drawing of it in 1871 when he um, when he bought the bill, when he bought the building, um, this wonderful picture is also at the at the Morgan, given to uh, it by Helen Phil Ewan, which I'll talk about a little bit later. She had just finished her dissertation at the University of Wisconsin on modern painters. Her dissertation told her advisor said, "I bet there are things about the, how Ruskin began modern painters at Brantwood. Why don't you go and have a look?" She was met by this man who was Ruskin's uh, first Ruskin student, later his secretary, always his very dear and devoted friend, W.G. Collingwood. And Collingwood said, I'll take you to the house and I'll let you have a look around. So she went to the house and in the house, she started going through all the things that had been left, all of Ruskin's original, not all, sorry, but a huge swath of Ruskin's original letters, many of his manuscripts, a huge swath of his diaries, none of them had ever been published at the time. And so she started looking at these things and before very long, she had a revelation. The story that she was reading in all the letters that were left in various packets that were tied up and in drawers and behind closets and all over, all over Brentwood, told a radically different story of Ruskin's life than the one that was in what is called the library edition of the works of John Ruskin. I'll come back to that in a moment. For the last 30 years of his life, Ruskin, here he is in the 1890s, not too long before his own death in 1900. He was cared for by Joan Severn, who was his cousin, who loved him very deeply, but never really understood what her great cousin was up to. And she became one of the literary executors of Ruskin's estate. She also got the estate Brentwood itself, but she began, became one of the people who was allowed to figure out what would happen to Ruskin's uh, literary uh, legacy after he died. And so he died in 1900. There was talk about having him buried at Westminster Abbey. He would have, if he would have been buried there had he died in London, but he said, if I die in Coniston, if I die at Brentwood, have me buried there. So this would have been January of 1900. By three months later, the man on the left, whose name is Alexander Wedderburn, another former student of Ruskin's, um, was um, also named a literary executor. And the man on the right, whose name is Edward Tyus Cook, decided along with Joan what, that what they wanted to do was to create 
a monument to Ruskin. They were going to create the greatest anthology that had ever been created, created to a great literary genius. They were going to call it the library edition of the works of John Ruskin. It is 39 volumes in size. It takes up over nine feet on the shelf. It is over six million words long, and there is nothing like it in the world. Shakespeare has nothing like this. None of the other great writers have anything like this. This is truly the greatest literary monument to a great writer that was ever done. That's what they wanted to do, and they did it. And here's why it's so great. Here's just one page from the library edition. This is from the, um, from the volume that holds onto this last, from the next to last essay. They took every one of Ruskin's manuscripts, which they got many, almost all of them from Brantwood, and they copied them out exactly verbatim, and they footnoted them in incredible detail. I want you to look at the bottom of the page here, the red boxed area, are just the footnotes to this one page. And so if you're a Ruskin scholar, I am one, you cannot get on without the library edition. And I want to show you how good they were. So here they are. These are those footnotes that you saw in the picture just a moment ago for that one page. Footnote number one tells us that the subject of inundations, especially in Italy, was presently to occupy much of Ruskin's thought, see in a later volume, etc. Footnote number two tells us it's a reference to Exodus 1523. Footnote number four, skipping down, is, an, is a reference to Proverbs 316. Compare another Ruskin book, uh, A Joy Forever, paragraph 120, where in the same verse is quoted, and also uh, uh, compare volume 16, page 103. This is just stunning stuff. If you're a scholar, you want to find out and cross-reference what all of this is about. They were just impeccable scholars. And so what happened was something else. And this is what Bill, Phil Yoon began to understand. She began to understand as she read through all the letters that a very different story of Ruskin's life was being told. And so she found this letter, many others as well, but I wanted to show you this letter. This is a letter by one of the people who worked at Brentwood for a long time. She was also Ruskin's secretary. Um, her name was um, Sarah Anderson. And she worked with Joan Severn after Ruskin's death. And I want you to read, I want, to, I want you to see, sorry, I want you to see a couple of paragraphs that are in this letter, which I saw the last time I was at the Ruskin Library in Lancaster. So the letter was written on the 7th of May, 1906. The original is at the Ruskin Library. And here's what Sarah writes to Joan Severn, Ruskin's cousin, one of the literary executors, she writes, I am more than thankful, those are her italics, that the DPs, meaning dear, dear Paz, letters to Agnew, Joan Severn's son, were burnt. I now have read all your letters, she means Joan's letters, and burnt all those relating to the terrible rosy times. This is a reference to Ruskin's abiding love for uh, Rose Latouche, which I'll say a little bit about later on. All the others are readable by anyone. So now we have a weight off our mind. In other words, there was a systematic censorship going on. Now, on page two of what you saw a moment ago, do search your mind, Sarah writes to Joan, for anything else that requires looking over and send it or keep it for me. And don't let us have scandals turning up after our lamented demises. And so, Russ, so what happens is that Phil Yoon is reading these things, reading all the other letters, thousands of them, I, I exaggerate not, which had never been published and realized that the introductory chapters to every volume of the library edition, which, is, which are biographic, telling you the story of how Ruskin came to write the works that are in that volume, that they had all been essentially constructed for effect. They were not telling Ruskin's story as it actually happened they were telling Ruskin's story as they wanted the public to get it. Two things in particular were always left out. They left out any reference to any aspect of Ruskin's life that they thought might raise the eyebrows of anybody who might buy the 39 volumes 
of the library edition. They left out all the references to his great, enormous, lifelong struggle with his father, John James Ruskin. They painted a picture that basically suggested that except for a little hiccup here and there, Ruskin and his father were very dear friends and adored each other. The truth was they did adore each other in a certain way, but they were never dear friends. In fact, they were at loggerheads all their lives. They left out all possible references except for a very little bit in the last volume uh, or the next to last volume on Rose Latouche and Ruskin's love for her. They didn't want to have anything getting out there about his love for this girl. Ruskin was 39 when he met her. She was 10. He fell in love with her. The relationship was always completely chaste. But when she died in 1874, he was crushed and never got over it and was miserable. And while he was miserable throughout all that time, that's what the reference meant, the terrible rosy times. And so Phil Yoon begins to be, see that there's a cover-up going on, that they've consciously planned to give a wrong impression of Ruskin's life, and that they've hoodwinked everybody who comes along afterwards for the same reason as this particular image that I showed you before. What it, they look like they're doing is creating this absolutely impeccable, unassailable, scholarly thing, which they are, when they're dealing with the manuscripts and the introductions are written in the same way with dozens of footnotes and so you think well these guys are the you know the best the best scholars in the world they're not going to ever tell us anything that um that's not true it's a great and a great tragedy and to my mind this is the thing that really lies behind why we don't know much about ruskin these days because the ramifications of this incredible cover-up have been so severe over the years. So I wanna tell you a little bit about Phil Yoon's basic insights into the Ruskin story. These are the things that she was going to include in her biography and then never did for reasons that I will still explain just a little bit later uh, in, in our time together. So the first major thing that she discovered is that Ruskin all his life was in deep, deep conflict with his parents, particularly his father, John James Ruskin on the left, his mother, Margaret Ruskin on the right. She had a phrase for this, it's her phrase, it's a great phrase. She said it was the ruinous struggle between the son and the parents. And it was such a ruinous struggle that it was the single thing that undermined Ruskin's life. If you look at Margaret on the, on the right, Margaret was raised, a strict evangelical. She believed that every word in the Bible was true. She dedicated her son, her only son, John, to God the day he was born. She wanted him to become Archbishop of Canterbury. She trained him and they read the Bible all the way through as literally true. They got to the end of uh, the New Testament, to the end of Revelation. They turned the page or many pages back, started with the first verse of Genesis, went through again and again and again and again. The result was, as you saw a moment ago, actually Ruskin became one of the greatest biblical scholars of all time. But in the same process, he was taught that all of this was completely true. He was told that the evangelical view of the world was accurate. Later on, he comes to the realization as a result of modern biology, modern geology, and one other thing that I'll talk about in a moment, he comes to the realization that that's not how it happened at all. The world was not started in 4,404 BC, and it did not evolve in seven days. So Ruskin has this struggle with his parents. Oh, I wanted to say one more thing about it. I'm gonna say, I wanna go back and pick this up. So because the training in the Bible was so strict, he was taught, of course, the 10 commandments, and he believed these were the direct revelation of God. And he was taught time and time again of the importance of the fifth commandment. And the fifth commandment, is that you honor your mother and father so that your days on earth will be long. And to Ruskin, this was always true. And so he always, despite his disagreements with his parents, he always adhered to the fifth commandment. He never overtly criticized them. He buried his anger, his rage, his frustration, his sadness throughout all his growing up years and uh, until it explodes much later. 1860, he realizes by now 
that the biblical translation, bi literal biblical interpretation of the world is wrong. He has had another experience, which I will talk about in a moment. He realizes that the culture, it is not, the, he, uh, another major moment in his life comes when he realizes that all the things that he had tried to teach in modern painters were not coming to pass. He wanted people to love nature. They continued to exploit nature. He wanted people to revere their place in the world as human beings and not to exploit other human beings. They continued to exploit other human beings. So he decided the only way to cope with this is the self-portrait from 1860, and you begin to see the lines of concern in his face. He decided the only way to confront this was to go straight at them and write the book that we've seen a moment ago called Unto This Last. But there was one other element in the great transition. This is, um, this is Turner's drawing of a nude, of a nude Swiss girl and a companion on a bed. They think it was done in 1802. It's at the Tate and Ruskin discovered when Turner died he was made an executor of his will. He declined that option. He asked to be made an executor, the person who would catalog his great gift to the nation, which was 20,000 paintings, drawings, unfinished this is that, sketches, etc. at the National Gallery. Well, he set to work in the late 1850s with his normal zeal, and among the Turner drawings that he found in sketchbooks were what could only be considered from the point of view of the times, pornographic drawings. To us, this looks pretty tame, but to Ruskin, this was pornographic, and there are others, which I'm not showing you tonight, which are really much more close to pornographic. And Ruskin was horrified because his argument in Modern Painters was that only the pure of heart can see the most beautiful aspects of God's creation. And so he said, well, and Turner saw the most beautiful aspects of God's creation. Here's one example. This is a morning in Flulen, Flulen uh, which is the entry to the St. Goddard Pass in the Alps. I mean, look at how beautiful and breathtaking this watercolor is. Here's another one that Turner did, the bridge at Rheinfelden. These are just spectacular. And Ruskin said only someone who had purity in their hearts could really do something as beautiful as this. And yet Turner did this. And so he begins to see that his whole interpretation of the world has been wrong in terms of assuming this whole notion of purity being the only way to get to a godly vision of the world and he's horrified. He's crushed by the Turner erotica. There were stories afterwards that he, um, he burned uh, with the, the curator of the National Gallery, a uh, number of the erotica. These have since been dis disproven. He had them filed away in different places and they were found much later on. So he starts writing his political economy. He writes onto this last. This is the front page of a first edition of the book. And his father, of course, you're not surprised, I suppose, by now. His father hated Ruskin, hated his son doing political economy. And so he said to, he said to Ruskin, he said to his son, you really should stop doing this. And I'm going to share with you just a very brief bit from one of the letters. So we're talking about the ruinous struggle. And Ruskin in 1862 finally explodes in a letter that he writes to his father from Geneva, Switzerland. He writes this, he said, earlier I sent you what you would feel to be an unkind letter about your pride. In nothing is that same pride more hurtful than in the way it has destroyed throughout your life, your power of judging noble character. You and my mother used to be delighted when I associated at Oxford with men like Lords March and Ward, men who had their, their drawers filled with pictures of naked women who walked openly with their harlots in the country lanes, men who swore, who diced, who drank, who knew nothing except the names of racehorses, who had no feelings except those of brutes, whose conversations at the dinner table would have made prostitutes blush for them and villains rebuke them. Men who, if they could, would have robbed me of my money and at the gambling table and laughed at me if I had fallen into their vices and died of them. John James, in front of us now, had been brought up in Scotland. His wife had been brought up in Scotland as well. He was a wine merchant. He made a fortune as a wine merchant. 
but he was always seen by the upper classes of Britain as only a shopkeeper. John James, who always felt inferior and wanted to be accepted into these higher classes. His son was a genius, and both of them together, in order to raise their own status in the world, decided to use their son's brilliance as a writer, and a writer of wonderful things about nature and how wonderful Venice was in the past, and architecture as their steppy, stepping stone to such places of elegance and acceptance. But unto this last made all those people furious. And with the result that John James and his, and his son fell apart. The last line of this letter is one of my favorites. Ruskin says he's never written a letter like this before. He says, I have seen you, he means his father, pay the greatest respect to people at your own table in our own house who were such utter knaves that they never knew what honor meant. So this is breaking the fifth commandment. I could give you much more about this, but the heart of the matter is that this is the ruinous struggle at work. Ruskin for the rest of his life felt guilty for attacking his parents as he did here. And later on when his mental illness um, begins to overtake him in the late 1870s and 1880s, he is racked with guilt about how badly he has treated his father. None of this is in the library edition. It is all simply not talked about and sloughed over. Helen wrote a book where she started to unpack this, Ruskin's Scottish Heritage, 1856. And she begins in the first part of her book to talk about the library edition and the fact that it's a distorted view of Ruskin's life. So she has in front of her now 34 chapters of her biography finished, The Ruinous Struggle. I published it with Van, Van Aiken Bird. I published uh, one of the chapters of her, of, of her biography, um, which shows the ruinous struggle at work and it's absolutely acidic effect on Ruskin's life and his mental health. Then, not too long into this, we're now in the 18, 1940s. Helen is working on, on the biography. She's two thirds done. She's almost ready to write the last 12 years of his life in about 12 chapters. And a friend of hers who, with whom she's been corresponding for about five or eight years by the name of F.J. Sharp, who lives in England and has a wonderful cache of Ruskin things. She has no idea what is in them, dies. And as he dies, he says to his landlady, I want Professor Phil Yoon, to have my Ruskiniana. So she goes to England and collects it, collects Sharp's legacy, and in it are these incredible things. This portrait, one of the most famous ones of Ruskin's, 1873, he did it for Charles Eliot Norton, his friend at Harvard. Um, it's at the Morgan now because Helen gave it to the Morgan as soon as she got it back to the United States because she did not want to leave it in any kind of danger in her own apartment or anywhere else. And you see in Ruskin's face here, the darkening lines of his depression overtaking him. It's a stunning thing to see in present, in, in its, um, if you get the chance to see it in uh, person. Also in the Sharp collection, letter upon letter about Rose Latouche. I, I should have mentioned this when we were talking about Rose in the beginning, um, that Rose, um, Ruskin had written Rose on the order of like 40 or 50 love letters, wonderful letters. He himself said they were among the best letters he's, he had ever written, which is for Ruskin saying quite a lot. And um, he died and he always kept those letters with him wherever he was in a rosewood box. And after he died, Joan Severn and Charles Eliot Norton, because Norton came over from America as a literary executor, um, they came over, they went to the garden they took the box to the garden behind Brentwood and they burned all the letters. So there was almost nothing left about Ruskin and Rose, except in Sharp's collection. There were dozens upon dozens upon dozens of Ruskin's letters where he talks about Rose, his anguish for her, his love of her and hers for him. And they, it's a very fraught relationship, which I certainly don't have time to tell you about tonight. And as time goes on, she leaves her parents Ruskin and she begins to go insane. She's got anorexia nervosa. She begins to decline. Ruskin is out of his mind with despair. He visits her, visits her for the last time on her deathbed in England. This is 1875 in May of 1875. And this is his um, picture of his dear love on her deathbed. Earlier 
and um, and he's crushed. And so he has his first mental attack, his first very serious mental attack with a with a psychotic episode in 1878. Uh, but he goes on, he continues on. This is Ruskin at work in his study in the 1880s. This is Collingwood's wonderful portrait of Ruskin um, at his study. This is where Helen, oh, you should look around, uh, look around the room um, because you see all the bookcases. Well, those are the bookcases where Helen found the letters and the diaries and the manuscripts. They were all in those particular bookcases. They had never been touched since he had died except for the library edition and they were all returned there. So this is a lovely historic picture that most people wouldn't get a sense of. So Helen now is faced with working on. She now has the Rose story to tell from Sharp. She now has more to tell on the ruinous struggle. She has 34 chapters that she's written before she learned all of this. They're all in need of major revision. She's got his servants that he wrote as a child, which are now critically important. She decides she's going to write a book on those. She's got um, a dozen new chapters still to write if she's going to finish the story of his later life. And then it's 18, this is Helen about 1860, sorry, 1960, and she's tired all the time. She goes to doctor after doctor. Nobody can figure out why she's tired all the time. And then eventually one doctor does and says, well, I'm very sorry to tell you this, my dear, but you have multiple sclerosis. And of course it's fatal and it's degenerative over time. So she's in 18, not sorry, again, 1960 with a massive amount of material ahead of her and she's dying. And then also in the Sharp collection, she comes across a number of, of things where Ruskin, she's reading along and she says to herself, my goodness, this sounds like Ruskin is telling the story of his own life when he's really telling the story of something else, like, uh, like this story of a young girl in Italy, um, which he calls Patience. And she reads through and she says, he's writing an allegory. He can't tell the story of his life straight out because it, wouldn't, it, it would go against the decorum of the age. He can't tell the story of all these things that have bothered him all his life, his ruinous struggle with his parents, because that would again be um, an, an ignoble thing to do. So he's doing it in allegory. So she goes back to her typewriter. This is Helen's typewriter. It's upstairs right now above me. Um, I inherited it after as Bert, Van Burt gave it to me, who had gotten it from Helen. And she starts writing another manuscript called Patience, where she explains Ruskin's symbolic allegory. Here's one picture of many I could have shared with you, but here's a wonderful picture. It's the frontispiece to the library edition volume with Proserpina, um, his book on flowers and how wonderful flowers are in the world. And if you look, if you think about Proserpina as a word, P-R-O-S-E. He's buried in the allegory that he's writing in the book, Rose's Name. And the title of this little piece of this little drawing of Ruskin's is, um, blo uh, is, sorry, blossoming and stricken in days. A thing that's alive, that's at its height in its early years, and then life takes its toll and work weeks, wreaks its vengeance on the body and the mind as time goes on. So she comes to this realization, this is another major thing she's going to talk about in her biography. She's got the ruinous struggle. She's got the Rose story. She's got the symbolic allegory story now that he's writing in all his late books in symbolic allegory. She has dozens of places where she's going to um, uh, tell her readers about all of this. She's gonna write a new book, Patience. And then she decides, I don't have time to finish it. She realizes for the first time that she cannot finish her own biography. 45 years of work. What can I do? 18, 1964, she says, I'm going to publish the Brentwood Diary. Another thing from F.J. Uh, Sharp. I mean, what a treasure trove it was. In that was this missing diary. And everybody, no one had ever thought that it had ever been preserved called the Brentwood Diary. He had written it all at Brentwood beginning in 19, 18, 1878 when he had his first attack of mental illness and she says to herself, I will do this. It's a stunning piece of scholarship. It's 400 pages long with many of the letters from the Sharp collection included that she thought were most important. Here's Helen 
in her apartment in Queens with her portrait of Ruskin in the back. That's an original portrait of Ruskin in the back, working on the Brantwood diary as she begins to work it into shape. If you go to the Morgan, you can see the actual Brantwood diary and you can see dear, poor, sad, Mr. Ruskin literally going mad on the page in February of 1878. She finishes it. It's published by Yale. It comes out in 1971. By then, she has almost no strength left. The Brantwood Diary of John Ruskin, Helen Kilfil Yoon, the Choice Magazine said it was one of the great scholarly books of the year, etc. And by 19, 1972, 1973, she is confined to her apartment in Queens, New York. This is where her apartment was, 167 Dash Crocheran Avenue in Queens. And on the 4th of July or June, I think it was, no, 4th of March. 1974, sitting in her chair with a Ruskin manuscript in front of her that she was working on, she died. And that was the end of Helen's attempt to finish her great story. Bird said it's one of the greatest tragedies in biographic history. It was going to be a, a book that would transform well, how we think of Ruskin. He said it was going to be a, a way for us to, re, to regenerate him as the noble human being he was. Ruskin always argued for truth. Truth above all, he didn't care whether it was warted. He didn't care whether it exposed things that other people might disapprove of. Always tell the truth. Ruskin would have hated what they did to him in the library edition. 2003, Van Bird and I are now very dear friends. We work together, we go to the Morgan together, we visit together and so on. And it occurs to one of us, I can't remember which one, let's go visit Helen's grave She's buried in New Rochelle, just north of New York City. So we find, we seek out Beechwood Cemetery and here's Van, we're trying to find, there's no record of where she's buried. We're trying to find where she might be buried and we're looking around for maybe an hour and an hour and a half. We find the Gill family plot. She's Helen Gill Phil Yoon. We find the Gill family plot and we look everywhere in the plot. The mother's there, the father's there, the brother's there, but Helen, is not there. And then we look down and we look at the map that has been given to us by the people at the main gate at the cemetery and we realize that we're standing on Helen's grave, but she's not marked as being there. She thought her life was a failure. Ruskin thought in the end his life was a failure. And so she didn't even include money in her will there wasn't much money in her will anyway, where she could be buried. And so she wasn't. Another symbolic little bit. Well, we thought that was too bad because we know how important Helen was. And so we got together with Jim Dearden and a whole bunch of other Ruskin folk, sorry. And um, we decided that we were gonna buy her a gravestone. And so we did. And in 2012, we placed the gravestone where, her, where she lied, Helen Gilfil Yoon, 1899-1974. Premier Ruskin scholar on the left, Ruskin's today symbol that he put on all his books, and on the right, the rose that Mr. Collingwood put on his grave in Coniston Churchyard. We thought that was pretty fitting for a memorial for Helen. Shoji Sato, one of our Japanese Ruskin companions, and I were there. We came back to Cortland, New York, where Van was. Let's see, this is 2012, so he was 98, and we showed him pictures of the event. It was really a lovely moment in terms of doing honor to this great, great Ruskin scholar. So it was an imperfect round, Helen's. Um, that's um, taken from a Browning poem. Um, and I've written it all up in a, in, a, in a book called The Imperfect Round, Helen Gill Fillion's R Life of Ruskin. And it is a great story. It's a great tragedy. She got caught in the web of her own work. She was such a meticulous, such an assiduous scholar that she, I'll give you one quick example. I'm almost finished now. Um, while she was at the Morgan, one day the curator of the Morgan said, we just have bought 600 letters 
from Ruskin's great friend of the 1880s, Kate Greenaway, the artist. Helen said, oh my God. So she's then set to work and basically set that to transcribing all 600 letters in her own hand. It's all there in the Morgan and it all can be seen. And she wasted, I don't know whether wasted is the right word, but she used six months to do it as she began to fade away further and further. She wanted to memorialize this great man as Gustav Borglum has done in his wonderful smallish sculpture of Ruskin. This is Gabriel uh, Meyer's uh, version of it, which is in his house and he'll, maybe he'll show it to you in a minute here. So that's in large measure the Helen Kilf Hill Gilfil Yoon story. What I really wanted to communicate to you tonight um, was how important she has been to Ruskin studies and she's still unsung. She is the entree into this, what I call this radical revision of, of Ruskin's life. Helen, had she ever finished what she had set out to do, would have become known as the, as the greatest Ruskin biographer of all time. So she worked at it. In the end, she failed, but she always had this wonderful vision. She always thought of Ruskin in this way, as one of the great geniuses of Western society. So in the coming lectures, we'll go on with this story um, if you're interested, but that is Helen's story, more or less. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, we have time actually, we have time for some questions. So if you'll just unmute yourself and ask your question, and Jim, if you will stay unmuted, uh, yep. then you can uh, respond. Yep. Well, if no one else will, I will. Um, this is Bernie Brandt. Um, I'm just asking that uh, I've noted that the entire library edition of Ruskin's works are available on the internet now. A group yes. of people uh, appear to have done so. Yes. Are there in the works or is there anything in the, in the, the future or has anything be, been done to make available this wealth of, uh, of, uh, of material from, from the Morgan Library? Um, right. It's a great question, Bernie. So I, I have a couple of responses. Um, one is, uh, as I told you at the end, I've written the whole Helen story in, in this book, but I've also, uh, there's going to be three lectures in this series, and all th I've written major essays about all three, including this one about Helen. And they're all on my website. G Gabe can give you the information about that in, in a minute or two. So that's one thing that's been done. Having a talk like this and getting more people aware of it is the second thing that can be done, that's done. Um, but the third thing is that I make the argument in a number of places that no Ruskin biography worthy of the name, meaning being worthy of being something that is in any way close to being true to what the life that Ruskin actually lived can be written until somebody goes to the Morgan. Some scholar goes to the Morgan. It can't be me. I'm like Van Bird. I'm too old to do that now. But it can't be done until somebody goes to the Morgan and plows. It's, it's not plowing because it's incredibly exciting to go through Ellen's material. Uh, see what she left. Somebody has to do that. As I said, it's certainly not going to be me, but some younger scholar could do it. And then a real Ruskin biography could be written. I did not say, but I will say right now, all of Ruskin biographies, all Ruskin biographies are wrong, are fundamentally wrong in, in, you know, we know where he was on a given day. We know with whom he had dinner. We know the year he wrote unto this last. We know all those things, okay? All of those things in them are true, but the basic outlines of his emotional life and his uh, life with his parents, none of it's there because nobody's, everybody was hoodwinked by Cook and Wedderburn's introductions to the library edition. Everybody thought, here are these great guys. They took these manuscripts and they did them in impeccable fashion. They annotated them in impeccable fashion. The introductions are written in exactly the same way. Why would we ever think anything was amiss? And so for 80 years until Helen, 
that's that's too long. Sorry, but let, let's say for 30 years until Helen came along, but then nobody got it anyway. Everybody used the library edition as the the introductions, the biographic chapters of the library edition as their entree into writing a book about Ruskin. And so they just compounded the error. So the real Ruskin story really has yet to be told. But that's how you got to get to it, I think. Somebody's got to somebody's got to take it on and do it. Um, and uh, it would be a great task. It would take a good part of one scholar's life, but it'd be a great service. Thank you, Professor. Yep, sure. I have a question. This is Maya Trahimchuk in California. Um, what about the texts? Were they also edited and rewritten, or are they all uh, as Raskin wrote them? Oh, you? another good question. Thank you. Um, the answer is they're perfect. Okay. Uh, I, I've checked this out, and because, of course, you think, well, maybe they altered the text. They didn't alter anything. The texts are perfect. So when I said before that um, that uh, anybody who does serious work on Ruskin really needs access to a library edition, it's absolutely true. I use my library edition all the time because if I want to know what the manuscript of Under This Last was or A Joy Forever or whatever, Reserpina, they've done it perfectly. And that was part of the cover-up. <laughs> that what they really wanted to do is that they wanted to show you how wonderfully well they'd done the manuscripts. Everybody said, yes, they have. And then they wanted you to not think that they hadn't done the introductions as well. One other thing I'll, I'll add here. Near the end of the library edition, there are two very large volumes of letters where Cook and Wedderburn have gone through the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of letters and selected a number for reproduction. Well, Helen found out early on, and then I found out, excuse me, through Helen, that many of the letters that are in the library edition in those two volumes are expurgated. Bits are left out, but they never tell you that. Sometimes they leave out a portion and they put in the usual scholarly ellipsis so that you know something's been left out. Other times they just cut out two sentences and they don't tell you that. If I had time tonight, I, I could show, I was going to show you one of them, but we don't, but we don't have time. But there are numbers of examples where they are essentially editing for effect. So it's another way to trick later scholars into thinking they're reading the true story. They think that these, these editors of the library edition are, well, of course, because their, ver their, their veracity is unquestioned in any other way. They think they're selecting only the most important letters. Well, they weren't. But well, the manuscripts are perfect. Jim, you've mentioned several times that, this is Gabriel, that um, one of the problems is that many scholars consult the Ruskin collections in the UK. Yes. But they don't consult the Ruskin collections in the United States. And that yes. there are many, many unpublished, uh, un lots of unpublished correspondence that would shed light on many of these things. But these guys don't don't uh, don't consult the u.s sources right and and that's a really really important point gabe so um i left out of my talk again i was a little uh, worried about um, i left out of my talk what are, what are what's called the brantwood sales mm. oh yes so after the library edition is completed in 1912 all the original letters and manuscripts go back to brantwood that's what helen found in 1929 Okay, she found all the original letters and manuscripts. She started reading them through. That's what gave her her insight. But in 1929, the only person who had any control over Brentwood was Joan Severn's husband, Arthur Severn, who was a painter. He was a rather profligate fellow. He needed quite a lot of money to live the high life in London that he was um, used to living, let's say. He was no great friend of Ruskin's. And so Arthur says, I think I'm gonna sell off everything that's in the house. So he takes the letters, they're bundled up. He takes the manuscripts, they're bundled up. And he has a series, he, he has a series of sales through Sotheby's in London. And Ruskin is still famous in 1929. And so Yale comes over and buys up a huge amount. The Morgan comes over and buys up a huge amount. Um, John Howard Whitehouse, who kept the Ruskin Library in, on the Isle of Wight for oh, a very long time, bought up a whole bunch. Oxford bought up some uh, in various... Library? Places. That's right. Well, no, no, there was no Ruskin Library. 
Ruskin Library is not 1999. No, no, Huntington Library. Oh, Huntington Library. Man Huntington Library buys, buys there under this last in 1920 yep. from George Allen, Ruskin's publisher's mm -hmm. son. Okay, but the short story is, nobody really knew this at the time, but the short story is that almost all the material that talks about the things that Helen understood came to the United States. So the Ruskin family letters that exposed the, um, the ruinous struggle were bought by Yale. And um, the stuff on Ruskin's marriage was bought by the Morgan. And then other letter sets were bought by the Morgan. They were bought by University of North Carolina, University of Illinois. So the bulk of the most important material for telling Ruskin's biographic story true didn't stay in England. Okay, so if you're an English scholar and you want to write a biography of Ruskin, you go first to the library edition, you read it, you figure it's true. You go to Oxford and you find out what's at Oxford and you find out what's, what's at other places around the UK. But all the most important stuff isn't in the UK. It's in America, as Helen learned, because one of the great advantages to Helen is that she, she had a professorship at Queens College in New York City, and she was right next to the Morgan. She would take that typewriter on the subway, you know, five days a week when she could, and she would go to the Morgan and type out letters. And of course she went to Yale, and she spent a year and a half at Yale typing the Ruskin family letters. And so she had all access to all this other material. So you say to yourself, well, if you're a scholar, of course you go to America. But no, you don't, for two reasons. Reason number one is you think the whole story is in England anyway. There's nothing much of import in America. And the second reason you don't go to America is because you're a scholar, you're a professor, you don't have much money. You can't go there and stay six weeks in New York City, eight weeks in New York City. And so the British biographers, and they're all British except for one, the British biographers never come to America. And so they don't, they don't find all this stuff that Helen knew. That, they're called the Brentwood Sales. They went on in 1930 and 1931. At the very end, I know I met somebody who was at the sales when I first started doing Ruskin. Um, an older man, of course, at the time. And um, he told me the last day of the sales, it was raining and raining and raining and all these boxes and the wind was blowing and the boxes would fall over and the letters would blow into the lake and, uh, and then they would sink in the lake. And, and, and all this stuff was lost, but also at the Brentwood sales at the end was F.J. Sharp. And he bought up a lot of stuff. And then he started haunting all the bookstores in Northern England, because numbers of packets of letters wound up there, sharp bottom, and put it in his collection, and they wound up in Helen's hands. That's an important part of the story. Anybody else? So this is a great scholarly sleuthing story to me. And, you know, I never, I was never particularly interested in Ruskin's life. But one of the things that happens as you go through this is that you begin to realize how deep this cover-up was. And of course, when I started on Ruskin, now quite a long time ago, nobody knew who he was. And thank God we have people now who do know who he was and more people are learning as well as we go along. But that's how deep the myopia had become. There are other reasons having to do with his mental illness and his supposed sexual proclivities, all of which are wrong, which I'll come to in the later lectures. But, but basically, Ruskin has been forgotten. And the real reason, the fundamental reason, is the cover-up in the library edition. Great. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Thank Jim, you for the Jim. lecture. Thank and you for all. And for shedding light on the work of this little known hero of uh, Ruskin research. Um, if you're interested, by the way, in reading the fuller versions of this material, uh, Jim's uh, monographs on the Ruskin biography are uh, available on his blog, whyruskin.online. Um, so you can uh, access them uh, there. Uh, also, if questions, uh, if people have questions, uh, if something occurs to you tomorrow morning that you wish you'd asked, um, 
be sure and um, email Jim at spates at hws.edu. That's spates at hws.edu, and he'll be happy to engage in a little email correspondence uh, with you. Uh, please join us next week, Thursday, 5 p.m., for the second installment in this conference on Ruskin's mental illness and alternative interpretation. So we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Well, Thanks, and thank Jim. you to the Ruskin Art Club and Gabriel in particular. Again. Here, here. Here, here, here. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. That's great. Right. Next time we'll make sure that the tech works. <laughs> <laughs> We're still rehearsing. We're working. <laughs> well, yes, puzzling, but never mind. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Thanks, everybody. What a great program. I like your backdrop. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> I'll, I'll be emailing you, too. Okay, great. I'm happy to answer anything or continue on. Take, Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Yep. Okay, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Good to see you, Deanne. Oh, all these folks. Hi, Kay. Hi. <laughs>